Recording. Great. Uh, okay, so thanks for having me here today. Uh, Sam is very kind in calling me a self-made mapper. I don't think I'm even that. Um, uh, I don't think I even uh, qualify for that. Uh, I'm maybe a little bit uh, have a claim for the DIY, but I don't have a lot of time for that with my administrative duties here. And I hang around with uh, with Ryan Taylor enough to know what GIS is. I think the main point of my talk today is just to perhaps pique some interest. Uh, I'm not going to answer all your questions about this, but uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the stuff I've been doing. And um, it's, uh, it's this little piece of plastic here that's gotten me in trouble. Uh, so about a couple weeks ago, I printed out this. Can anybody recognize what, what we're talking about here? Grand Canyon, okay, so this is Grand Canyon printed out with uh, three times vertical relief. And I showed this to Ryan, and then he showed it to Sam, and Sam got excited, and so now here I am here today um, and with the printer outside. My interest in all of, in this uh, ability to print out landscapes, basically, stems that I spent a lot of time teaching Mars exploration to freshman non-major students and uh, you know trying to get them to um, re to to you know come to understand Mars as the world that it is and they're non-majors and there's a whole lot of work obviously being done with remote sensing on Mars and there are more and more digital elevation models that are uh, being uh, captured and harvested, and um, we'll be mapping Mars uh, continually. So I thought a couple years ago uh, it would be really nice to uh, you know be able to actually print out some of these places we're looking at, so the students would have actually something in their hand that they could hold. They could uh, tilt in different directions, maybe shine light for, on it from different directions to get an idea of of shadow and so forth. So, uh, you know, this, this is a, a, a 3D print of a DEM of Gale Crater where the uh, Curiosity rover is. Uh, I was fortunate enough uh, a couple years back to actually find someone who had taken the digital elevation model and converted it into a format that I could print out on my printer. Okay. I actually never really uh, pursued this much for my class because at the time there was a pretty... Uh, convoluted workflow process that was involved that had a fairly steep learning curve. You know, I could probably figure out where to go to find the DEMs that had been uh, that are being developed uh, for for Mars, but uh, you know, actually translating that into the kind of files that I could print out on my 3D printer was just more than I uh, wanted to deal with at the time. I mean, basically, the process is. Let me get a pencil here. Um, you know, you start off with some source of a digital elevation model. And that is probably more your world than mine. Uh, so you need to think about what, what DEMs you have available to you. What are, the, what are the models that you're working with? And what might you want uh, printed out? And then, you know, Send it to a 3D printer, which is more my DIY kind of uh, hat for the talk, and, uh, and print it out. Now, this is printing out the Eiffel Tower because it's just an image I got off of, the, of, the, of Google Images. But let me just say, um, you know, if you are going to get into this, you want to think about uh, the kind of file formats you need to, to deal with. So um, primarily the most useful one for doing 3D printing is this STL file. Stereolithograph is the, the file name extension. It's basically a way of describing three-dimensional objects. And those, this is a file format that almost any 3D printer that you might have laying around, you know, in your, in your office, whatever, uh, would be able to accept. So the big question is, you know, how do you get those digital elevation models into a format like an STL file format or an OBJ or a VRML file format that can be compatible to the software that's going to run your 3D printer? Um, 
just a quick point here. You're not gonna you're not gonna print out a 3D uh, rendering of some uh, terrain that you're interested in working in that will fill up that table on a 3D printer. You're gonna be limited in uh, the print bed size. Uh, the printer that I've got out in the hallway there can produce models that are 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters by uh, approximately 20 centimeters high. The, high that, that, that's volume of a cube. No. Of course, the landscapes are pretty flat. If you are uh, wanting to do something bigger, you might uh, try to find someone who's got a uh, CNC laser cutter um, uh, available. And the idea there would be then you could cut out different uh, layers of your topography, stack those layers up, and make the same kind of 3D model. Kind of the stuff we did in the 1960s, if you're in uh, architecture, but much more laborious. The, the complication here, though, is that STL file format that uh, the, goes naturally into the 3D printers is um, a three-dimensional file format. What you have to do is come up with some kind of workflow. You know, you might use open source tools like Blender and other kinds of things to take that three-dimensional model, slice it into layers, and then uh, create the um, file, the PDF files or the other file formats that we're going to feed into the laser cutter to cut out those pieces. You want to make sure probably you've got the ability to you know, drill some holes at the same location on each of those layers so you can register those layers, stack them up appropriately, glue them together, and voila, you'd have a big one of, of these rather than a small plastic one. So uh, what I mainly want to talk about today is a tool that Ryan and I, that Ryan discovered that Ryan and I have been playing with that makes this process a lot easier for uh, DIYers uh, like myself uh, who don't live in uh, ArcGIS and other you know tools like that. Um, but before I do that, I just want to talk a little bit about this 3D printing process because as I've talked with people out around the printer, there's been a lot of interest about it. Essentially, what you're seeing here is a, a representation of the DEM for uh, Letchworth State Park up in uh, <coughs> upstate New York. Uh, this is uh, basically been brought in as an STL file into the uh, software that controls uh, the Ultimaker printer, which is one of printer that we've got over in New Media. And you can see, uh, kind of see that there's a 3D volume there. What the software does is it slices that into horizontal layers. And the way the 3D printers work is that there are plastic filaments that feed into the printer. They get heated up to so where the, plastic, the filament can be extruded out from a print head. And then layer by layer, uh, the 3D object gets printed. The first layer gets printed down. The second layer goes over it. Here is, for example, uh, that model of Letchworth State Park where the first five layers have been printed. And right now, it looks kind of boring, right? Because what do you see? You just see flat surface, because at this level, you're still basically underground for the whole DEM. And so you're basically filling in that, <coughs> that volume. Up a little bit higher, like say to layer 27, you can begin to see places where the printer has not printed for that layer, meaning you've basically broken the surface in those areas. And it continues to print in the areas where it continue to build up higher and higher parts of the ground surface. So you eventually get something that um, looks like Letchworth State Park. Mm -hmm. So again, the process theoretically is pretty simple. You have to have some source for your 3D models. In our case, when we're talking about GIS types of data sets, we're talking about primarily digital elevation models. But I suppose you could also do a SketchUp version of Purchase Campus and with all the buildings and so forth, along with the topography of the campus, and have that as your 3D model. Whatever it is, you've got to have that somewhere or have uh, some place to get it. The trick is uh, in the past has been 
how then do you convert that into an STL model that you can take into the printer software? Uh, this is the printer software for my printer uh, and do that slicing and then once you've got the slicing done you can feed that data into the printer and the printer can just crank away. Okay, So I'm currently printing off what am I printing off right now? Uh, Cranberry Lake Preserve, uh, a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter plot of it, and it's about a four hour print, and we're about halfway through, so in a couple of hours it will be, it will be done. Uh, so in terms of a class situation, this is not something that I have my students do and then print off at the end of class, right? Uh, so that's something I've got to worry about. Uh, for uh, all of you, you have to think about, well, you know, what might you be interested in having a model printed out of? Uh, how are you going, where are you going to find that uh, model? Uh, how are you going to output it? And then are you going to pick up a 3D printer or are you going to find somebody to print it off for you? Um, so what I really want to let you all know about today is this very um, user-friendly web application that's been developed at Iowa State, uh, my alma mater actually, but I wasn't involved because I haven't been at Iowa State for the last, I don't know, 40 years. But it's basically touchterrain.geogeal.iastate.edu. If you do a search for touch terrain, you'll, you'll pull up this site. It basically has a Google Maps kind of interface. You, uh, you always start out at this location that they built this model for because uh, these geologists from Iowa State must have a summer field trip where they always take students out to this place. And they you know, always had a trouble having their students actually get a feel for the place, so they built this web app basically around what they needed. Um, and, um, you know, you can zoom out, you can zoom in. I basically zoom out to see the whole of the United States, move over to New York or Connecticut, wherever I want to get a model out, and zoom back in, uh, select the area that I want to print out, recenter this red uh, rectangle around it. Uh, you can, it doesn't have to be square, it can be, uh, you know, whatever shape you want. If you wanted to build actually a big uh, model that would fill up that, that plate, uh, that, that table there, you could um, basically, you have the ability to have this program actually um, do as many tiles X by Y as you want. And each one of those tiles, you would specify what the tile width was. This, uh, this, uh, goes from basically five centimeters up to 20 centimeters. Um, and, uh, you know, if you did each of these tiles at a 20 centimeter square uh, size, you could do a fairly decent job of filling up that table with uh, the topography here. Be a whole lot of printing. You'd run through a whole lot of filament and a lot of, lot of hours, but you could do it. Uh, I won't go through all of these things. I will just mention that uh, one thing you want to think about is um, how much vertical exaggeration, the Z scale, you want to use. Um, I find that uh, doing a 2x uh, vertical exaggeration kind of brings out the features a little bit without th making things look too weird, and I'll show you that a little bit later. And then by default, it is set to take this landscape that you have selected export it to an STL file, and then you just uh, take that STL file to your, uh, to your colleague who's got a 3D printer and say, please, sir, can you print this for me? And uh, so if you hit export, now I, I have to um, warn you, this is it's somewhere between alpha and beta version of this website. Uh, they're still working on, on getting some of the features, but you click on, it will go... Uh, well, here's, for example, uh, you know, I zoomed back out, came over to New York, and zoomed in on Ward Pound Ridge, uh, which was one of the Westchester County parks, right? And uh, I'm specifying this is the area that I want to print out. You can see the two times uh, elevation, uh, eight centimeter by eight centimeter square, essentially, is what I'm printing out. And I click export. Um, plain vanilla page saying, press the start button. 
and uh, with a little warning that when you press the start button, a whole lot of stuff is going to be going on in their servers, but they're not going to tell you anything uh, or update you about the progress or anything. So that's the, that's the kind of beta part of the, of the site. Comes back a few minutes later if you're lucky or longer if the system is busy with a zip file. And basically you download that zip file and expand it out and you get this STL file that basically has the a longitude and latitude um, and from the center of the uh, sub area that you selected as the file name. That's plenty. Okay. So then you uh, feed that into your 3D printer software, control software. And here's uh, Ward Pound Ridge. Uh, 2x vertical, and many of you probably can recognize the topography there. And, um, and you get your little pieces of plastic. Okay. And so here, this just shows you, um, you know, the difference between the 2x uh, vertical exaggeration and the 3x vertical exaggeration. Um, Again, you can see that things start to look a little funky when you exaggerate the vertical axis a little bit too much. But, um, you know, that's much of what I wanted to do in terms of presenting. I mean, the whole idea, again, is to maybe um, spark some interest. Think about, you know, what models of the landscape or other features that you might want to have actual physical... Um, an object that you can actually hold in your hand and look at and rotate around. Um, as Ryan and, our, uh, and I carpool, he's getting more and more excited over the last couple of weeks about the possibilities here. Uh, basically, being, and we're also getting into drones, so we didn't do a drone uh, discussion today, um, Ryan. But uh, the idea that we could, you know, fly drones, uh, get the data to develop the 3D model of the landscape, and then feed that right into the printers in the lab. And that could be something that the, the, you know, the students work on as projects for um, you know, getting a baseline understanding of the environment that they're working with and as they, we then send them out to do more things. So like, uh, like Sam said, I'm, I've been running the printer on outside in the hallway and a number of people have stopped by to take a look. Um, I think we've got time for questions actually, right, Sam? <laughs> yes. So, um, failure mode. One thing you really want to um, think about if you're thinking about pursu pursuing this direction is, do you really want to own a 3D printer? Uh, they are getting better, but um, you know, I, I said that I printed out the Grand Canyon, Ryan and Sam got excited and roped me into giving this talk. And then immediately for the last two weeks, I've been having trouble getting uh, printouts from my 3D printer. I've been uh, you know, starting the print and the base layer has been buckling and bubbling up and uh, I've been back and forth with the um, help support for the printer that I've got and they haven't been all that helpful. And so uh, I, been having some successful prints out in the hallway today, but it was not until yesterday that I thought that I might actually bring the printer over. The printer I've got um, is a, a basic printer. What, if you think about buying a 3D printer, what kind of prices do you, do you think come to mind? How much? Somebody says 2000 5000 5,000 going once. Yeah. Going to, <laughs> now, now my printer was like 499. My printer, um, I won't, I won't get into brand names because my my job here is not to sell different brands. But you know, my printer is kind of the inkjet printer model. They sell you the printer cheaply and lock you into using their cartridges of filaments. Okay, I've got another printer that. Uh, uh, you know, given what Ryan and I have talked about, about wanting students to do this, I broke down to use some of my end of the money, end of the year budget money to buy another two dual filament printer so we actually can print two 
colors at once, maybe put in a green and a blue and, and be able to specify that the lakes come out blue on the, on the, on the printout. Uh, and that one was $8.99. Okay. So unless you're doing high-end industrial metal fabrication where you're building uh, 3D rocket nozzle parts like SpaceX, uh, you know, you're not going to be needing to spend a gazillion dollars to pick up a printer. And they're not easy to find. You know, we've, um, you know, you think, I mean, in the government space, you know, HP is the big plotter printer that we all use in government. And yeah, HP is not even in this. Thing. Yeah, well, it's, it's really weird. And, and to go back to the, the title slide, the DIY meets GIS, 3D printers came out of the maker movement. Okay, and so the big model for a long time was MakerBot. Um, but if, I mean, if you do just uh, best 3D printers under 1,000 2017 search, you'll find uh, who the current uh, players are in the field. Okay. Keith will be around for a little while longer. If you have any questions after this session, you can kind of go out and okay. take his brain, okay? Thanks. All right, thanks, Keith.